Hello anatomy and physiology students and welcome to your virtual lab on cardiovascular physiology. Now in this lab we're going to tackle a variety of topics including talking about the cardiac cycle, talking about how to use a stethoscope, how to use Fignal manometers to measure blood pressure, and also evaluating the effects of body position on blood pressure as well as age on cardiovascular fitness. Okay, so let's talk first about the cardiac cycle. Remember the heart is a four-chambered pump. We have two atria and two ventricles, and the ventricles do most of the pumping the heart. That is, the right ventricle pumps to the pulmonary circuit, and the left ventricle pumps to the systemic circuit. So let's see what's going on in the ventricles during the cardiac cycle. So first, let's start off down here in the beginning of ventricular diastole. During diastole, the ventricles are relaxing and they're filling with blood. And towards the end of that diastole period, we actually have uh, atrial systole, that is atrial contraction, forcing a little bit more blood into those ventricles before they begin to contract. And then we enter the period of ventricular systole. Now, systole has two different subphases. We have something called isovolumetric contraction. During this phase, the ventricles are contracting, but they haven't contracted enough to overcome the back pressure in the pulmonary trunk and the aorta. And then we get to the actual period of ventricular ejection. So this is the period in systole where the ventricles are contracted enough, that they've generated enough pressure to open the semilunar valves and eject that blood into the aorta and pulmonary trunk respectively. So just to summarize, there are two different phases we need to worry about. One is systole when the ventricles are contracting, and the other is diastole when the ventricles are relaxing and filling with blood. Now we'll learn later on there are different pressures associated with this. The systolic pressure is the pressure when the ventricles are contracting, and the diastolic pressure is the pressure when the ventricles are relaxing. All right, before we get into discussion about blood pressure, we're going to talk about how to use a stethoscope to estimate the heart rate and auscultate heart sounds. Now, a stethoscope is a pretty common instrument used in the allied health field, right? We have uh, basically a bell right here as well as the earpieces, and there is a wrong way and a right way to wear a stethoscope. This, unfortunately for Dr. Izzy Stevens, uh, is the wrong way. The way that we want to wear our stethoscope is like so. So if you take a look at the picture over here uh, on your left hand side, you can see that the earpieces should be facing backwards like this at an angle uh, going to the back of the body. If they're facing frontwards to the front of the body, it's going to be very difficult to hear uh, those heart sounds. So always make sure that they're facing backwards. Now if you're looking at your stethoscope while you're putting it on, take a look at which direction the earpieces are. If you can actually see the holes in the earpiece, it probably means you've got them the wrong way and you need to turn that around before you put that on your body. So right here I can see that I don't see the holes and that the uh, tubes are facing backwards, so that is going to be the correct way to wear a stethoscope. The other thing about a stethoscope is you might have a one bell or a two bell stethoscope. If it has two different sides there, realize that only one side is turned on at one time. So put those earpieces in your ear and then tap on the uh, bell and if you make a sound you can hear in your ears, you've got that side turned on. If not, you want to turn that about 90 degrees and then try it and that will turn it on if it wasn't on before. Okay, in auscultating or listening to heart sounds, what we're listening for is the sound of the valves closing. And that would be the aortic semilunar valve and pulmonary semilunar valve, as well as the atrioventricular valves, that is our tricuspid and our mitral valve. Now depending on which valve we really want to listen to, we can choose different locations on the chest wall. And down here you can see those approximate locations, they're listed as intercostal spaces. So you have to find, first of all, where the clavicles are, follow the clavicle down to the sternum, and then find those uh, spaces where you're going to listen to either the uh, semilunar valves up top, or down below you're going to listen to your mitral and your tricuspid valve. The mitral one you can see that we listen to uh, right down close to the apex of the heart and that's where it's going to have its maximal intensity. Okay, so if you've stopped at this point and listened to your heart, you've probably heard that there's two different sounds that are apparent, and that is lub and dub. The first sound you hear, the lub sound, is called S1, or sound 1, and this indicates the closure of the atrioventricular valves when the ventricles contract. So initially, those valves were open, allowing blood to go from atria to ventricle, but when the ventricle below contracts, it snaps these valves shut, which prevents blood from going the wrong direction. So that's sound S1. 
Now sound S2 happens as the ventricles begin to relax or during ventricular diastole. So as the ventricles relax and begin to swell and expand, the blood in the pulmonary trunk and the aorta wants to go backwards, but then the SL valves are going to snap shut. So this is S2, closure of the semilunar valves. And what you can see on this EKG is that uh, closure of the AV valves, uh, S1, actually happens a little bit after the QRS complex. There's a little bit of a delay between QRS, which is depolarization of the ventricles, and the actual contraction of the ventricles. So keep that in mind that there's a little bit of decoupling of the actual electrical activity with the actual cardiac activity or contraction of those chambers. All right, now let's talk about pulse. So in medicine, a pulse represents usually the tactile uh, arterial palpation of the cardiac cycle by somebody with a skilled set of fingers. And I have in there arterial is outlined because arterial is important. We cannot get a pulse on a vein. Veins don't have a pulse, but arteries do, and that's because arteries are carrying high pressure blood away from the heart. So the pulse may be palpated in any place that allows an artery to be compressed under the surface of the body, such as the neck, the wrist, etc. We call these peripheral pulse points and we can use the pulse to estimate the heart rate. The heart rate is simply the number of beats uh, or pulse waves uh, per a minute. And normally for most people, that's gonna be somewhere between 60 and 100 beats per minute. Now, if it's 100 beats or over, we say that person is tachycardic. And if it's under 60, we might say that person is bradycardic. Okay, now we need to say something about the apical versus the peripheral pulse. An apical pulse is a pulse that is measured over the heart, usually using a stethoscope. So usually we place that the stethoscope approximately at the area of the maximal intensity of the closure of the mitral valve around the apex of the heart, and we're listening for how many heartbeats we hear per minute, and that's the apical pulse. On the other hand, the peripheral pulse is usually detected by palpation rather than auscultation. That is, we're actually feeling uh, or compressing an artery with our hand or fingertips and trying to count the number of pulse waves per minute. Now, ideally, these two numbers should be exactly the same. If they're not, we could have something called a pulse deficit. A pulse deficit happens when there's a difference in the apical and peripheral measurements, and this could indicate some cardiovascular pathology. All right, the first activity we're gonna do today is palpate the peripheral pulse at four different regions on the body. We're gonna start out here with the carotid artery, and then move on over to the brachial artery, which is right here, and sort of the inside of the arm. We're then gonna to move to the radial artery, which you can detect right here using two to three fingers uh, placed right along the radius bone. And the last one is called the posterior tibial artery. Now this is just posterior to the medial malleolus along the ankle bone. And it's a little bit difficult to detect, but you should be able to detect uh, the pulse rate in all four different pulse points, and it should be the same, right? It should be the same as your apical pulse or the pulse you detected uh, using your stethoscope. Now, once you've taken these measurements at all four points, I then want you to put your stethoscope back into your ears correctly, and then listen for your apical pulse at the same time while you're trying to palpate your radial pulse. It may be somewhat difficult since you only have two hands, but you should be able to get there, and you should realize that for every heartbeat you hear, you should feel a pulse wave in your radial artery. What you will notice, however, is there's probably going to be a delay. There'll be a bump and then a whish, a bump and a whish, because again, these are waves. It takes time for the blood to get from that left ventricle all the way down my brachial artery, all the way to my radial artery. But ideally, these two pulse numbers should be the same. Now, I do want to say one thing about measuring the pulse. If you're in a hospital situation, you don't always have time to spend a total 60 seconds with a patient. The other thing that happens is oftentimes they're moving around, which can interrupt that 60 second counting period. So you can really estimate the pulse or heart rate by counting a fraction of a minute if need be. So for example, a lot of people will count the heart rate for 15 seconds and then multiply that by four. Let's say that I got a heart rate of 20 beats in 15 seconds, what would the pulse rate be per minute? Well, it would be 20 times four or 80 beats per minute.